thank you everyone for joining and welcome um, to Passive House Accelerator Live's Next Gen. Um, and this is where we discuss the future of Passive House and look to the next generation of practitioners who are shaping uh, the future of building. Um, and of course, you're gonna enjoy today's show because our guest is um, no stranger to this program, as you can see. And he's a real mover and shaker and champion for pushing the envelope. So um, Carmel, can you give him a proper introduction, please? Yes, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, you know, AJ's a, a big, big hitter around these parts. Um, <laughs> Robert AJ Patton, as, as maybe those close to him know him, um, is an accomplished finance, sales, and capital markets expert. He has more than 15 years experience in investment banking, endowment management, real estate analysis, and development. And he founded 548 Capital LLC and 548 Development LLC to combine his expertise and track record of creating consistent returns with a personal passion for helping transform communities. Um, he's developing solutions for housing, environmental, and economic issues facing inner cities. And in 2022, AJ combined these companies under the 548 Enterprise umbrella, creating a full-service entity that provides solutions for all aspects of the development process. While AJ currently resides in Chicago, he's actually coming to us live from D.C., where he's speaking to the American Council on Renewable Energy, uh, where he's an Accelerate member. He's got a, a lot of accolades, and I won't list them all, um, but notably, he's a um, Midwest Energy 40 under 40, and we're really excited to hear about um, what he's currently working on and what he's got going on next. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. Around. <laughs> Last time we did this, there were people all over the over the globe here, so thank you for having me. Um, so I'll, I'll present, and then we'll have some conversation and, and look forward to talking to everyone about all the things that we have going on. I'd be remiss if I just didn't start with the most appropriate thank you to the entire Passive House Accelerator team and family. They have really embraced what we're doing in here in Chicago and uh, just really thankful for uh, their continued support and advocacy and encouragement and just follow up and just support. So thank you guys for having me. So uh, why don't we get started? We'll, I'll tell you a little bit about 548 and the projects and the uh, evolution of the developments and what led us to the passive house uh, developments that we have currently in the pipeline. And then we'll open the floor for questions. If we get some technical questions, I, I think we've got one of the consultants on the line. Uh, Scott's floating around here. Uh, Farman, he should be floating in here somewhere where we can uh, get, get into the details or we can talk macro. So Jay, why don't we get started? I'm going to walk you through a handful of the projects and talk about the education that led us to the two passive house developments and uh, a little sneak peek into what we've got next. And so there's a whole, I mean, frankly, uh, 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 what I will showcase is a PhD in failure. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a bit of the dissertation of how we got it and kind of the education from there. And so next slide for me. So this is just a geographic, if you know Chicago, um, we're spread out. We've got, this is about half of the developments that we have right now. This is spread out all through the south and west sides. Um, you know, we've got, we're committed across the entire community. So this is just uh, the Metro Chicago. We've got stuff in the uh, surrounding uh, Collar counties as well. Next slide. So here is where we got our PhD in failure. These are the two six flats. And uh, it's important I talk about these. These did not get, um, we didn't get a major certification. These are um, utility energy efficiently, energy efficiency supported grants. Um, we went, uh, the big kind of lesson for me that my takeaway from these two six flats, these are two, two, two bed, one bath, um, gut rehabs, um, my big lesson was the value of insulation. And what we started doing was uh, going down this path as we were rehabbing the buildings, I felt like I made two major mistakes. I was really intentional about setting things up for solar because we do rooftop solar on these, on these projects as well. We thought really intentionally about the HVAC systems, but we could have did a much better job of insulating the walls. And it's it's a frankly a, a oversight on our part. We we I don't have the R values handy on what we did with the six flats. I do have it on the other projects, 
but it was a lesson for me of we did not put the, enough uh, insulation on the walls. And then um, we still ended up with gas stoves, which is kicking, uh, you know, I kick myself every time, you know, I'm, I, I think about this, these projects, but I'm really, really proud um, uh, that, you know, these were our lessons uh, in these projects. We went above and beyond on uh, some of the lower U value on the windows, but I, it was a great lesson for us about the value of insulation. And if we're going to commit to electrification, I should have thought about the stoves. So then that leads to this project. We, we did them all the same. This is 79th. This is a mixed use development, another rehab. Um, we, we're making, you know, we made a boatload of progress here, but we landed essentially on the exact same decisions as the six flats where we set up for a really good rooftop solar. We did VRF, which really kind of shocked the neighborhood. Um, and really, we only have a boiler on site for the retail. Um, and so everything else, once again, all electric, except those darn refrigerators, uh, <laughs> the darn stoves. And so we did everything the right way. And I'd be remiss. This, I know it's a recorded line. I, I have to shout out Lowe's. Uh, they need to sponsor the Passive House Accelerator. Let me just say that now. But on top of that, they donated to support all of our projects um, to make them uh, more energy efficient and help us with appliances and lighting fixtures and water fixtures. They did a great job in supporting us hit our uh, sustainability goals. So there's the progress from the six flats to here. We've got VRF here and you're starting to see the building blocks of our development strategy. Next slide, please. What leads us here? This is South Loop Solar Lofts. Um, if Katrin was here, she would she she likes to fight me on this development um, because we we could not get there of making this um, passive house uh, as an adaptive reuse. We couldn't make the numbers work, which I'll talk more about later. But this will be all electric uh, with EV charging stations, uh, over 150 kW rooftop solar systems. And we're just really, really proud futuristically about this development and how competitive it will be um, in terms of the lived experience for, for residents in the community. And so once, but this one, all electric, we didn't make the same mistakes as before. We've got the right MEP uh, team and we really, um, uh, we, we really kind of took the blocks from the previous smaller deals to this one. I, I, I want to give a shout out to the architect in this one, his name's Greg Williams of Greg Ramon Design Studios. He's really disappointed that we couldn't get this to passive, but um, we got, you know, we, we, we were in heavy pursuit. We made progress and we learned from our lessons of, of, of previous uh, developments. Next slide, please. Which leads us to uh, our graduate school, Galleria 89. This is a project on the south side, uh, 89th and commercial in the south side of Chicago. The architects, uh, this up, an upcoming architect by the name of Doug Farr. Um, being, I'm a little tongue in cheek there. Doug is kind of known as the sustainable guru in Chicago. Um, he is, uh, you know, he he's he's Doug's amazing, right? He's an advocate. He's a leader, um, and uh, tell you know, and we've been. Great, but one of the things that we did with it that I that I'm passionate about, and if you've heard me speak, I've said this many times. You know, Doug's the leader in many ways of the Chicago sustainability efforts, but we need more. And so my challenge to Far Associates, as we went and pursued this, and you know, we started this development, we needed to bring new um, engineering and consultants to the table that historically are not included in developments like this. So we brought in Millhouse Engineering. That's an African-American owned engineering firm. Uh, Engage Civil, which is another African-American um, um, uh, engineering firm. And we put them on the development and, and gave them real uh, you know, equity in these developments so that they could take control of these narratives. And Doug embraced that um, and really led that. So I was grateful for his partnership. And so we're really proud of this development here on the South Side. And we're looking forward to that. Next slide, please. And here's some, some details on some of the decisions. I know some of you guys are practitioners and we'll wanna uh, kind of roll up our sleeves on some of the um, kind of the basic you know, stuff here. 
once again, the thing I'm most proud of, because I, I don't pretend to be the greatest in all of the details, but what I do know is we got to learn from the past. Uh, those wall our values, the roof, the roof, the window, all of that stuff, we took a lot of thought into um, in making sure that we hit our numbers and our um, our sustainable goals. Next slide. Man, I love those uh, gal those renderings. Um, this is Humble Park, essentially the same story. Um, this is a West Side community in Chicago. It was a winner of the Invest Southwest program in Chicago. If you're familiar with that, that's the mayor's um, it, program to invest in under uh, dis mostly disinvested communities. This is another passive house development. Uh, we brought Lamar Johnson Collaborative is the lead architect. The principal is Leslie Roth, the young woman of color, and she killed it. She did a great job. She knocked it out of the park. We're really proud of it. Um, and we created other opportunities for some other folks to participate on the uh, engineering and, and consulting side. And uh, this is very, very special um, a project. I think this one uh, will end up being the largest in the city for maybe a few months. So we're proud of <laughs> we're proud that we'll have the largest passive house development for a little for maybe I'll I'll you know I'll get to wear that T-shirt for about a month. Um, next slide. And so here's some other um, decisions that were uh, a part of this as well. Um, they were specific to point out some of the ventilation and uh, space conditioning decisions that we made here. Um, you know, as you guys know, each deal has its own is its own story. Every development is is its own story. There's a uh, one of the architects I work with in the past that every every development is a song, right? And the instruments that lead to the song. And uh, he's a, a big jazz guy, and so he's got me thinking about how each song, each each development is a song. And so these developments. Um, you know, you know, each development led to this, and this is kind of the crescendo moment for 548 is frankly Humble Park. And it's, you know, it's a, a, over a city block in Chicago on Chicago Avenue. If you know Chicago at all, that is a main pipeline. So we are very, very, very proud of this. I'm uh, excited about uh, talking to you guys more about kind of our evolution and growth. I mean, there was a lot of, um, you know, we've got the Scots on the line to talk about some of our back and forth about conversations about makeup air and some of our plumbing decisions and, you know, all, all that comes with, um, you know, some of our window openings, our glazing discussions. Uh, we're, we, it took us a while to get there, um, but we kept fighting that fight and just stayed committed to it. And that was everything that mattered. Uh, so I believe that may be the close of my uh, presentation uh, and we can uh, maybe switch. It might be time for a commercial break. Thank you so much, AJ. And um, I'm sure we'll get more questions flooding in um, since you kind of just teased us um, with the details of your upcoming projects here. So um, a note to anyone who, you know, is now prompted with many, many questions about um, all of these details, please put them in the chat and we will certainly uh, try our best to get to them. I think there's definitely room at this point. Um, but yeah, thank you, AJ. It's really important that you share all of this with us, especially, you know, the failures that you've learned from so that everybody else doesn't have to um, personally learn from those failures. And then, you know, as a developer, um, you know, you have this influence that uh, not necessarily the rest of the passive house community has. So um, before we get into questions and additional comments, um, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you too to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Brennan Brennan, 
Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Coltraco Ultrasonics Micro Air Leak Detector, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and U.S. Engineered Wood T-Stud. Thank you, sponsors. And thank you in advance to Lowe's for their future sponsorship of EHA, putting that into, <laughs> into the universe. Um, thank you, AJ. You know, learning is a success, and um, and you've just gifted that to, to all of us. Um, we're going to run a quick poll at the top of this Q&A, so you might see that pop up on your screen for a second there. Um, but we already have a, um, a long queue here of, of questions. And um, uh, Noah Reimers, you are up first. You had two questions, I believe, for AJ. Great. Yeah, thank you, AJ. Appreciate uh, you jumping on here. Um, and listening to your, your podcast that you did with Passo, Passive House Accelerator, you mentioned a lot about the importance of having uh, Mayor Lightfoot's uh, support and her office's support. I was just curious how you went about building that relationship and building that support uh, from her and her office. Uh, how do you build support in Chicago? This recorded line. Nope. I don't know the answer. No, <laughs> no I, you know what? I, I will say this. Um, we, this was, this is the power of positioning, right? And so what we learned from the six flats and from 79th street, those lessons learned positioned us to be one one of the leaders in development for sustainable developments. It just so happened she was looking for it. And so th then she rolled out the Invest Southwest program. And we were uniquely positioned to kind of answer the call on those RFPs. Um, frankly, I still don't know the woman. Uh, she's, I sing her praises every time I get a microphone, uh, but she, you know, she's trying, she tries and tried to reimagine Chicago as a city of merit. Uh, is is kind of pushing back on some of the old political days of our city. And uh, we were lucky enough to merit her support and, and the resources of the community. And I think uh, that spoke volumes of, of our relationship. Thanks. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, it's great to hear about how those, you know, initial projects led to those learnings. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that actually kind of leads to my second question. I was just curious, um, what are the major considerations that you look for kind of at a high level when you're evaluating existing uh, buildings and their suitability towards uh, being renovated to a passive house standard or, or close to it? Yeah, great question. You know, I think there are kind of two things that were impactful for um, for the reason why we did not do it for uh, the South Loop solar lofts. There were structural concerns about the number of units that we were trying to meet, uh, reach. Uh, because there's some technicalities of some of the resources that we're using. There were some strings attached that we needed to meet X amount of units and then trying to fit that inside the current uh, you know, building. So then we added a, uh, a layer uh, or added an addition um, on that front. Then there's the zoning Im implications. And then frankly, there's all the, the hovering two things for us and all, all these deals is structural with adaptive reuse. And then two uh, is cost. Right? Can you get there on the cost uh, with with in times of the cost? And we'll talk more about that. But frankly, like there's not enough data out there for for me to say with in, with clear with a clear conscience. Here's what it costs to do an adaptive reuse. Here's what it costs to do a new construction, and the impact of those decisions is why, particularly for the Chicago market that has its own nuances. You're talking about entirely union labor. Then it's post COVID. So we know, you know, materials now magically cost uh, two and a half X. And so you layer in, you know, we support organized labor, but there's, there's, there's a cost associated with such. And you layer that with the material increases post COVID. I, I'll use Humble Park as an example. I, back of the envelope, negotiated with the GC. I said, you know, I think we'll come in at about 296 a square foot. And Noah, we came in at over 400. 100 by the time everything was said and done with COVID. Now, if you're a negative Nancy, uh, they'll say, well, that's because you're doing all this great sustainability stuff. No, if I did, if I weren't doing any, any of that post COVID, that's what it costs to get things done now. And so what, what we're trying to flesh out with all these developments happening at the same time is what are the real cost premiums associated with these sustainability um, commitments? And then simultaneously, 
uh, what's the in- impact of those commitments, right? Because it, no, it's your point. Sorry, you got me going down a rabbit hole here. But to to your point, to the to your, to your question about the decision making tree. Sure, if I spend an extra three hundred grand on HVAC, but if I know what my payback's going to be, or the savings generated, or, and or which we cannot uh, leave out, what's the difference in the lived experience for? the people that live there. I mean, we can't take that off the table either, right? If if we're going to light big old cigarettes inside of every uh, 800 square foot apartments, we need to take that into consideration about what the impact and the implications are to our families. So uh, those were some of the decision-making. Sorry, I I went on the rent. There's a lot more questions, but Noah, that's kind of where my head goes. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. That's the right rant to go on. Um, And and I know that there's a lot of questions about that and a lot of data needed um, to answer those questions still. Um, So uh, we have Patrick Carahare, I think had also two questions. You're up next. Yeah, uh, we've involved in some passive house projects out here in in British Columbia, which doesn't get as hot as Chicago. Um, So what, uh, I guess my question is what, what have you done actively and passively uh, to try to keep these buildings from overheating? Because we suffer from that out here, uh, much less Chicago, where it gets a lot warmer than uh, Vancouver. Yeah. Scott, do you want to take that one? I, I do have Scott on standby for some of you. Get, get in there, yeah. bro. Everyone. Um, so to mitigate overheating during summer conditions, um, I don't know if AJ mentioned it, but the building, the the Galleria and the Humboldt Park project are both following the FIAS um, certification protocol. And the way that FIAS works, I'm sure you all know, but we not only have to meet uh, an annual cooling demand for the building, but we also need to meet the uh, you know warmest day of the year, summer design condition, the cooling load. So the envelope is, you know, with that, <laughs> fine-tuned to balance both heating and cooling at the same time. So we have a couple strategies in place, you know, making sure that our solar heat gain coefficient on these buildings and in the selected glazing uh, units are not too low, not too high. So we get to take advantage uh, of heat in the winter, but also block that summer sun when we don't need it. Um, In these units, you know, they're pretty dang dense and uh, it, 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 passive house buildings and dense multi, multi-family typology. Um, there's a lot of heat in the spaces itself, not even looking at the sun um, coming in on top of that. So, you know, this puts us towards lower solar heat gain coefficients on the glazing. Um, operable windows to help with passive cooling, but really, you know, uh, A lot of things to consider nowadays with outdoor air quality. How often do you really want to rely on on windows for your your passive measures? So we're, you know, leaning heavily into energy recovery ventilation ventilation and the uh, heat recovery VRF to provide space cooling to, you know, keep people comfortable on those extreme days. Hopefully that answered that question. And I know I I, uh, see... Sean pointed out, I brought reinforcements here for any technical questions. And then also, I just want to shout out uh, Louie here, who's also on the screen. He was the design architect for the Humble Park development. So I just want to acknowledge him as well. So thank you, Louie, for joining us. Next up, we have uh, Tallow or Talo Arc. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Go ahead and ask your question. No, my question was that why wouldn't we go fully passive windows, because when you, when you have like a street front to see in the retail, uh, it's not, I find that in the projects, the uh, that extra passive going to 0.1 instead of 0.19 really makes the whole game so much easier, <laughs> that's all. And the roof insulation, I always go with 90 instead of 60, because it, again, it when you start playing the game at the end, you have this. You have room to make errors and adjustment and so forth. AJ, do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Keep shooting. Jump I'm, I'm jump behind. I, I got a question for him about the. So you're. So you would prescribe. And Scott, you can still answer the question. But I guess it, it, the undertone of your question is 
that you would go heavier on the roof R value, right? In as a protective measure as we go out to execute. And the windows. Yeah. So um, I think maybe in the presentation, we're working with a, a bit older information. The windows, at least on the Humble Park project, which is the one that I'm involved in, are the Intis Supera certified windows for the residential piece. Um, you know, love it or hate it, the way that FIAS works, we can exclude certain parts of the building from the boundary of the certification. And because most of the first floor is planned to be future retail built out space, the current approach is to not uh, look at that as fine, as fine as the residential portions. But I do know that storefront window uh, selections are still kind of in flux and we're, we're evaluating that kind of every day here as we fine tune the certification. Uh, roof insulation. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, one thing that we have to all keep in mind is there are diminishing returns when it comes to insulating a building. I know that the passive house approach is to insulate to a certain point uh, to prevent heat loss and really minimize that energy use day in and day out. But, you know, from our perspective, if you're looking at the building holistically, you're not getting as much value out of taking your roof from R60 to R90 as you would be putting some of that insulation elsewhere. Um, that's my unofficial position to that question. Um, yeah, always good to hear um, kind of everyone's uh, learned wisdom on um, you know, the right ratios uh, in different locations. So um, that's why we have these conversations. Uh, next up, I think we have Peter Molinar. Um, had a couple questions as well. I think we probably have time for asking um, one or both. Um, yeah, uh, two or three questions for you. Were there any improvements made to the venting of the coping on the parapet walls in these projects? So they don't con condense the moisture underneath the roofing. Scott, I'm going to keep leaning on you today for the technical support. Sure. I don't probably can't answer that. Peter, I'm guessing you're talking about some of the existing building projects, right? Uh, yeah, I wasn't not involved in those, so I can't unfortunately provide. Yeah, I so can't. I can't speak to. Can you can you restate it for me, Peter? Maybe I, I could speak to those. The. Uh, improvements made to venting uh, the coping of the parapet walls. So there's a friend of Mark uh, who does this work in Chicago, and uh, he he can make great improvements to the building's longevity by allowing the moisture to come out the top of the parapet walls, where it's uh, traditionally it's closed in, sealed in, and it condenses and rots out the the beams and the woodwork inside. Yeah, that would that's new that no one has brought that to my attention. That's something that we'll have to take back with us. Talk to Mark sometime offline. Awesome. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And uh, the other question would be, uh, did the uh, renovation designs optimize the domestic hot water time to tap the way you place the hot water tanks to taps? I don't believe so. On the rehabs? Nope, I don't yep. think so. Some for us to consider. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Great presentation, well, and well, uh, good luck with these uh, projects going forward. Thank, thank you. No, and I, I, I opened the floor by saying I got a PhD in failure on the six flats and the rehab. Uh, so, if moving forward, if I could be referred to as doctor, I'd be grateful. Um, but yes, it was important. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things I would do different going back on on those deals, but. We we're trying to, you know, prove ourselves early that we we really had something and that it could be, it worked in the pro forma and was sustainable. And so we're still working through that. So I'm thank you for bringing those to my attention. This is a good segue because Mark is up next for his question. So my question is: Do mockups play a role in your success and sequencing and training? We haven't done any of those yet, but to slightly pivot, I will say this: one of the things that we did do that was really productive was we did a integrated design workshop. And so we brought everybody to the table and 
on all the deals at once because all these deals were are literally happening at the same time. And we put everybody in a room and then the rest were all virtual. And we started throwing ideas on the board and said, hey, engineers, there's there were 15 engineers in the room, literally. And it was this decision versus this system versus that system. What's more efficient and what costs, you know, what's what's the cost associated with that decision? And we went through every single major decision. And then, oh, by the way, across the table, we put uh, the contractors in the room. So we had contractors, engineers, four architects. And so we didn't do a full mock mock-up, but what we did is we we locked in a room for three hours and literally went through the decision-making tree. And I, I'd be remiss to not acknowledge that Lamar Johnson and Doug Farr's Farr Associates agreed to do that. And everyone, you know, just uh locked in and said, let's let's figure out what the best decision was. And that would be able to streamline decision making, potentially procurement strategies, so that we can get some uh, you know, some impact out of doing some combined procurement. And so um, we we that was kind of our approach to kind of visualizing the execution before we got started. That's so awesome and such a powerful way to like force people to to talk and learn together, right? Like this, this creating this open source, you know, cross cross development lines. Um, emphasis on the word force. <laughs> Sometimes you have to. Uh, cool. We have Corey up next. If you want to mute and ask your question, um, just a very quick question. I wanted to find out what particular insulation uh, material do you use for your roofs and floor, uh, roofs and uh, ceiling, on um, on those passive house designs in Chicago? Thank you. I think Louis told me he did not want to speak today. He just wanted to show up. <laughs> I. I I don't have a final answer for that. Unfortunately, uh, the pricing exercises are a bit ongoing. So I unfortunately do not have that information. Matt, do you know what we spec? I believe right now the roof is a rigid foam product. Probably a poly ISO is the basis of design, but we're you know looking at it every day to see what it needs to be and if there's opportunities for improvement, both from an R value and a you know GW perspective it's original you're right shannon has several questions aj wonderful presentation fantastic thank you for leading in this space so much um, you answered mostly uh the beginning part of my question about return on investment can you speak to if you had strategies that played into securing financing related to return on investment specifically with all the solar you did, envelope improvements, or monitoring? And if you had problems with a lack of access to capital, because it was so hard to prove some of those things. Yeah, uh, I, I could do a separate presentation on access to capital. Uh, that would be, uh, be a two hour, I could do that two hours with no notes, probably. Um, we did not combine we, um, the historical, I would not compare, I would not tie the two, the issues of access to capital to our sustainability commitments. Uh, I would have probably had the same issues of access to capital if I would have done a boring glass block box. So I think um, for better or for worse, the access to capital issues are just, are just the harsh realities of, of my line of work. Um, but uh, and but and also in support of that, this is where the mayor and Noah's previous question becomes uh, important. The mayor promised to fill all the uh, funding gaps as long as it was inclusive and affordable. And so the mayor put the money up and filled all the fun funding gaps, which then made the banks come to the table and say, well, if she's going to fund your gaps and essentially backstop the deal. Then this is becomes a no brainer. And then magically all the banks thought I was cute. So, then you know, we worked out our relationship. So that's kind of how that, particularly the big three deals worked out. Uh, there's two of the big three deals worked out was through that uh, mechanism. You know, one of my frustrations currently in the marketplace, though, because this is adjacent to your question, is that there isn't a uh, compiled source for developers to go to and say, "Here's the here's the financial impact of each of these decisions." And so, uh, even if you're not ready to commit to passive house maybe you're you're willing to you, there's some impact on a particular uh, hvac system 
or to Talo's point about the impact of insulating more further insulating the roof or the walls, right, Shannon? So to me, I, I what the thing that I'm most obsessed with in this moment and what I'm so excited about with these deals is I am going to open source all the data from the construction costs associated with the deal and everyone can have it. And we're gonna compile all the deals together and people can just see, developers specifically can see, maybe I don't wanna pick all this menu, but I'll take two or three things and I'll do it and I'll assign it to these particular deals. And maybe they'll back into making more of the decisions that my firm has made, right? And so, but I think it starts with data because as a developer at the end of the day, I, ha- I you know, we're signing the guarantee. This thing has got to work. If it flops, then, you know, we're, we're all in trouble, right? So, um, but I, it, I, as I started down this path, I'm searching for the data and it's just not there. And it's not specific enough. There's people assigning like, well, if you do passive, it's only 6% increase. And then you start to tease that number a little more and figure out where it really is. And it's really hard to find. And then people ask me, other major development firms, all the big guys, they say, hey, what you're doing, it's it's cute. But is it, are, is it really ready for prime time yet? And uh, in their most condescending tone. Um, and and uh, um, I can't. I can't smack them with the data yet. You know, I can I can push back because I've been working out, but I can't push back with any data, right? And that's what matters most, right? So, sorry, Shan, that's that's my uh, my Noah <laughs> tangent of the day. <laughs> Never apologize for that kind of tangent. Fantastic. I dropped a link in the chat from an article in the New York Times about three days ago that featured uh, Derek Tillman, who you may know from Bridging the Gap. Um, and it's about Black and Latino real estate developers struggling to get funding and having to prove that ROI. So yes, I think a whole nother episode is needed and wanted there. And um, uh, also, I know Beth Eckenrod is on the call, and she has some really great uh, data about cost and passive house. And I threw in one more thing from Fias Khan about noise-related illnesses and heat-related illnesses and the associated costs of those which never hurts to have handy. So we're with you. And uh, anytime you want to reach out and ask for infographics for all this stuff, um, we'll all share because you're sharing it back. And it, I'm very excited about the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Appreciate the encouragement. Could I squeeze in an on-topic question to AJ super quick? Please. AJ, how has some of the new incentive and rebate funding kind of changed the calculus on the pricing side for you? Um, Did I feed you that question? No. Okay. That that feels like an alley-oop there. If I wasn't 5'8", I'd dunk that, you know? (laughs) Um, uh, uh, It it will only help on a couple of levels. I think there's there's a couple of ways we can look at this. So... um, one, the local utility, and, and I'm, I'm in D.C. and I'm meeting with all these people nationally, and I always have to be rem- reminded that every municipality is different. Once you cross that state border, the realities in Chicago are not the realities in Tennessee, right? And so everybody's got their, and then I saw there's like Canadians here, heaven forbid, there's like Canadians in the room, uh, but <laughs> don't mess with you. every municipality is different. So like one of the things that's helped us, Scott, is, as you know, the local utilities, ComEd, they've got some resources. So they put about 200 grand in for us hitting all of our two or 300 grand, actually maybe up to 400 grand uh, for hitting all the energy efficiency metrics. Simultaneously, there's been a lot of talk about 45L, which was, I believe, a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. 45L, the number 45L, and it's a tax credit tied to hitting your sustainability metrics. And so I believe it's another quarter million dollars into the capital stack of free money to support uh, these these hitting certain sustainability metrics. And you start to layer those. And then Katra and I talked and she, she's on to my strategy here, which is where the impact of solar comes in on top of that, right? So you can start to see a capital stack emerge. So then one of the things that we're doing, you know, also own a solar company, we're putting solar on the top of these. We happen to we live in Illinois. Solar puts um, solar on top of affordable housing in the state of Illinois can be installed free of charge. 
So by the time you take the state incentives with the federal ITC incentives, you can get solar on top of affordable housing free of charge. So now you can size that rooftop system to match your uh, common area meter. You've essentially zeroed out your master meter, particularly for an all electric building. Now you just lower drop operating expenses. So now I've got the attention of other developers. Now they're calling me saying, well, you mean you can give me free solar and you take my electric bill cut in half? That's a win for everybody, right? And so um, you're right, Scott, the, the, the numbers are moving very, very quickly um, and people are starting to pay attention. And AJ, isn't, um, I mean, I could be wrong about this. I, I don't know much about 45L, but isn't it kind of being um, updated right now? So there might be even more incentive or, or slight differences? It, it's in real time. We, we probably talk about 45L twice a week. <laughs> I've got somebody on it full time just because we're already, all of us here who live this are already meeting the standard to the max. So then we just need to get educated, get the right accountants in the room and uh, make sure that we can take advantage of those resources. Great. Well, maybe we'll need an update on on all of those changes in the future um, as things change. We'll need, we'll need an accountant for that, though. We'll need an accountant for that. <laughs> all right. Uh, Carmel, who do we have up next? I believe we have. Um, let's see. Uh, Tom Phillips, I, I'm not sure if there was really a question in there, but he was bringing up overheating risk. And um, yeah, Tom. You can... Hi. Yeah, I was. Um, thanks for the great presentation. It's always inspiring <laughs> to see what you folks are doing in the challenging times and uh, and finding uh, money in political support. I uh, this is related to financing, too, in a way, because um, I was wondering how you're addressing uh, life cycle impacts of climate change in terms of rapidly increasing cooling loads and and um and you know where your region is going to look more like um <laughs> arkansas and missouri by mid to late century so if you if you plug those numbers in it would really change your cost calculus too i would think over the life cycle there's a lot of us there's a lot of work we've got to do and putting our arms around each the impacts of all these decisions and what it means in the short term. I'm going to pivot your question just slightly to say I've been spending a lot of time uh, thinking about life cycle and legacy uh, because I'm a new dad. <laughs> and it, it's something about being a parent that transitions your brain to stop thinking about the next 10 years or, you know, I got a few gray hairs that the barber has to cut now to what's the planet going to look like, a, a, you know, 80 years from now when I have grandkids and so forth running the planet. And so many of those things are coming top of mind, uh, Tom. And I think that it's, you know, it's not lost on me. I'll, I'll say that it's not lost on me. Well, I, I guess just to follow up, um, I'm, I'm curious to see what you see as your next big challenge or uh, tweak to your, uh, your program. Well, Zoe, uh, come, uh, maybe we'll wait on that. I, I'm going to, Tom, I think you're, I'm going to maybe announce Maybe this it. is a natural time to ask that question. <laughs> uh, we, um, we can talk about it if you like. Tom, you maybe, maybe you just pulled a Scott and you just threw me an alley-oop there again. This is uh, the setup. Yeah, Tom, we, we had scheduled this big bomb to drop in like five <laughs> minutes, but maybe now is the right time, AJ, if you want to share what yeah, the if, future. If, we, if we've answered everyone's questions, I'm fine with uh sharing what we're working on next. Yeah, I think we're we're actually in a great spot and there might be more questions coming out of this bombshell. So um, why don't we, AJ, you know, this is our this is our ongoing question. What is the future of Passive House? So uh, I am here to share and announce that um, my foundation is launching and uh, going to build the 548 Energy Institute right here in Chicago. And uh, we're building a new 70,000 square foot net zero facility uh, on the west side of Chicago. Uh, that project has already begun uh, in the initial design phase. Uh, it will house uh, a workforce training center. 
uh, business incubation center. It will also be policy and advocacy work, uh, building education and build uh, and people that want to transition into the clean economy. This will be the hub for all of these things. Um, we've secured the land and the support of the city. We've got uh, we're going to announce some support from the governor here in a couple of months and uh, a major corporate donor that would like to back it as well. And so we're finishing up. That's that's part of the reason why I'm here in D.C. this week is to lock up the last of the uh, resources that we need uh, to uh, finish out this project. So what's what's next for us, Tom, is to uh, we need a place. There needs to be a facility uh, that the country can go to and, and, and beyond can come to and get the resources and education that's needed in order to take the next step of bringing more people into this tent. Um, and so uh, that's what I'm, I'm passionate about and trying to build the next generation of developers, contractors, and service providers that want to build clean communities. So that's what's next. Yeah, any other questions that you want to um, ask yourself that we should just <laughs> put, put into the queue that would be nice to answer? No, I'm excited. And I, and I started at the top just to say, uh, this is a great group, and I am very uh, uh, grateful that you guys have welcomed 548 and some of the Chicago uh, coalition uh, to just come and just participate and support and engage and so forth. You guys send data and, and notes of, of encouragement, and so I'm grateful um, and uh, looking forward to uh, spending more time and advocating alongside of you. This is a great time to um, let's like all unmute and just say congratulations and give AJ a round of applause. Um, Ooh, yeah. Ooh, thank you. Thank you. Applause. This is, I mean, it's exciting to our community and, and to, um, and to literally the future of, um, of the workforce and of the, the brain power behind trying to solve all these difficult, difficult issues that, that are facing us. Really exciting stuff. Um, I, I have a, a question myself, if, if it's okay to ask, and then um, we'll probably leave a few minutes at the end for, for breakouts. People can connect um, in smaller groups. Does that sound good? Shoot. So with all of these lessons that you've learned um, and with the, the ability that you've brought you know, people to the table together, um, what do you look for now um, in terms of screening, you know, contractors and and people that you bring on to these deals? Um, like what are what are the biggest gaps that you've seen and things that you kind of scrutinize um, moving forward? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. Um, I heard a sports radio analysis, uh, a sports radio guy said this about um about a year a, a while back when Indianapolis won the Super Bowl got to not won the Super Bowl, got to host the right to host the Super Bowl. And he said, uh, follow me here for a second. He, he, he said, I'm going to open up the lines and I want everyone from Indianapolis to call me and tell me the best restaurant in Indianapolis. And everyone called and said, St. Elmo's. And if you've ever been to Indianapolis, it is the best restaurant in Indianapolis. It's called St. Elmo's Steakhouse. And he said, I'm going to do the same thing. Everyone from New York, I want you to call me right now and tell me the best restaurant in New York. And as you guessed, they all said 5,000 different restaurants. And I attribute that to this room here where, you know, I'm in Chicago and God bless Scott. So this Scott, plug your ears. But everybody says there's one good engineering firm to do sustainability. We should not be agreeing on that. There should be 30 of them. Who's the best sustainable architect? Everyone says Doug Farr. And I love Doug. Doug and I are going to have a, a buddy cop film come out. Like we're like super close. This is my guy. But there should be 25 Doug Fars. And I'm passionate about bringing new people into the conversation. And we've got to be intentional about it. Right. And I'll, and I'll give you another anecdote. Uh, there's a dirty secret about me going around and I'm going to address it. Uh, I'm born and raised in Indiana. It's true. I'm from Indiana. <laughs> That's the secret. I got my break. All these deals that you've seen are in Chicago. If I were to take these deals and, and have done them in Indiana, I'd be the largest African-American developer in the state of Indiana. 
But in, in Illinois and in Chicago, I, I'm not even in the top 10. But that's because Chicago has been intentional about creating opportunities for people of color to lead developments. I use those anecdotes about the value of intentionality and us being intentional about opening up the doors and this not being just the cool kids, but bringing new people into the conversation. So to Tom's previous point, that for 50 years from now, we've developed a real pipeline of next generation engineers and advocates, designers, and developers. That's the impact, right? And that's the thing that I'm most passionate about right now. Goosebumps. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, with that, I, yeah, I think we just want to thank everyone for being here. These were really great questions. Thank you so much to AJ and Scott and the whole team um, for, I mean, sharing everything. <laughs> that That's what it's all about. And um, it's, it's really helpful, really needed. So um, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for the, the thoughtful input and questions. Yeah, thanks, AJ, for peeling back the curtains a bit for us and continuing to share that that work. Um, and yeah, um, just an important point that Scott made at the end here is um, across the nation, we need to keep engaging with our local de building departments, you know, our, our policymakers and um, and get this stuff um, approvable, mainstream, funded, etc. So um, I know that your Energy Institute will do so much work in that space. We're really excited about that. Thank you.